today's class we are going to look at uh, transaction processing concepts. Uh, any uh, doubts on this uh, particular class you can email your uh, doubts to uh, the email address that is shown uh, in the slide here uh, djram at iitm dot ac dot in. Now, we will look at what is the meaning of a transaction in databases. A transaction is essentially an uh, atomic unit of access which is uh, either completely executed or not executed at all. So, uh, typically databases store data of interest and uh, we have applications trying to access uh, the database and modify the data that is stored in the database. Now, one example is a banking database where uh, you wish to transfer uh, funds or withdraw amount from your account in the uh, bank database or you want to debit or credit certain amounts or transfer amounts from one account into another account. When uh, the database is operated upon by the applications, we have certain instructions that will be executed. And these instructions are not uh, just normal instructions as executed in an operating system, but they need to obey something more than the normal instructions. What we are going to see is we are, we are going to look at the instructions and then see how these instructions need to be taken care of or what properties need to be enforced on these instructions uh, which we call as transactions. Now, the, here are some examples of typical examples of transactions. Many enterprises use databases to store information about their state. Now, uh, any occurrence of a real world event that changes the enterprise state requires the execution of a program that changes the database state in a corresponding way. For example, balance must be updated when you deposit into a banking database. When you withdraw an amount, it basically need to update again your account by modifying the balance correctly. So, typically what uh, we say is a transaction is a program that accesses the database in response to real world events. They are basically going to modify the state of the database. Transaction essentially modifies the state of the database. Now, here is a very simple example of a database transaction. As you can see here, it is a debit transaction which tries to withdraw a particular amount from a banking database. Here we show that there is a debit, an account number and a debit amount is uh, given to the debit transaction. Now, the begin transaction shows that uh, this is the start of the transaction, execution of the transaction. Now, there are three instructions which are part of this transaction. The first one is read uh, the account number and the balance that is there in the database in the banking database. Now, as part of the read instruction we are going to see later what are all the other instructions that need to be executed when this read instruction has to be executed by the uh, transaction. Now, after uh, this read instruction succeeds you will have your account balance in the variable uh, called balance. And now, this uh, balance has to be updated correspondingly with the amount that is going to be withdrawn from the uh, account. As you can see later, after the uh, withdrawal amount, the new balance has to be computed by changing the balance and then the new balance has to be written onto the database back. And finally, you signal that this transaction is finished by giving an end transaction. Now, what we basically see here is the three instructions i d 1, i d 2 and i d 3 shown in the slide here together constitute what we call as a transaction. 
Now, normal programs we do not basically distinguish by grouping instructions together and saying that they together constitute a transaction. Now, we will go further deep analyze why these instructions put together will be called as transaction in this particular case. Another example could be a credit transaction as you can see here again we have a credit transaction being supplied with an account number and the amount that you would like to credit. As in the other case you have here a begin transaction and a end transaction signaling that all the instructions in between constitute together a transaction. Now, as uh, done in the earlier case, the read instruction or read instruction is going to fetch the balance from your uh, bank database given the account number. That particular account number, the balance will be read from the back end database. Now, the new balance is computed by adding the amount that you are crediting into the account and now you have to write back the new balance back into the database. Now, these are very simple examples of what is a debit transaction and a credit transaction in the case of a banking database. Now, we can see how these uh, transactions in, uh, in reality operate on the database. For example, it is shown here in terms of the credit uh, process which is shown in the slide shows the credit part of the transaction which we saw earlier. Now, if you look at the debit part of the transaction you can see that uh, the debit process executes the ID 1, ID 2, ID 3 instructions shown earlier. As shown in this figure the back end database which is stored on the disk contains the uh, information or the data relating to the bank customers. Now, the credit or debit transaction needs to access the database and retrieve the information and correspondingly modify this information and after modification they need to write the information back onto the database. Okay. Now, let us understand this little more carefully here. Now, we have as part of the debit transaction ID 1, ID 2 and ID 3. ID 1 is a read instruction. Now, this read instruction has to go to the back end database management system which takes care of actually now finding out the corresponding data on the disk and move the data back to the local variables of the process debit process. That is now after the ID 1 is executed the balance variable will have correct data relating to the current balance that is there in the account number. Now, since it is a debit transaction the balance is going to be updated here by withdrawing the amount from the current balance and the new value will be computed which will be stored in the balance variable. Now, at the end of the transaction debit transaction the value has to be written back onto the back end database and that what signals the end of the transaction. Now, at the beginning of the transaction the value is read from the bank database and at the end of the transaction the new value is written back onto the database this is what we mean by a transaction. A transaction essentially is reading some data from the database processing that data according to the semantics of the transaction and the new changed values are being written back onto the database at the end of the transaction. The same thing actually happens in the case of the credit transaction that is shown here except that the new balance is now added with the amount supplied. Now, we are going to see when the transactions are operating on the database, we need to have certain properties that needs to be enforced on these instructions. So, that the state of the database is in a consistent uh, fashion.
Now, let us understand what are those properties and what happens really when the transactions are executing on the database. Now, here is the case where we are explaining what happens when the transactions have to read data from the database. As shown earlier in the figure, we have to first find the address of the disk block that contains the data item x. x in this particular case can be a balance, it can be an account number. So, it is basically the data that needs to be fetched from the back end database. Now, once you have actually found the disk block, you have to copy the disk block information into a buffer in the main memory that is the local variable that is shown in the figure earlier. Now, once the item has been copied into the buffer, the value of the disk block is copied into the buffer, then you have to copy that value into the item x to show that the program variable named x now contains the value that is fetched from the disk block. This is what the read operation which is shown in the transaction signifies. Now, we have correspondingly a write operation which shows how the uh, write is executed. In this particular case, you can see that uh, find the address of the disk block that contains x and now in this particular case, you not only fetch the value of the data, you are going to modify the data and then the updated value is going to be written back onto the buffer as shown here. You can understand here the last step is different from the earlier read operation. Store the updated block from the buffer back to the disk that is the extra instruction that is going to be executed in this particular case. Now, essentially read and write are the two operations that are going to be used by the database transactions. And uh, we have seen how the read and the write fetch the required information for the database, uh, fetch the required information for the transaction from the database. That is what was explained right now. This is similar to a normal process which would have read the value from a back end disk file. This is essentially same concept as of a process trying to open a file and read the information from a file. What more has to be done here is, it is not just a set of file operations that are being performed by a process, but we also need to enforce certain conditions on these instructions so that the database state is always maintained consistently and that is what we mean by a transaction and the transaction has to enforce these properties on the instructions it is executing. One of the things that will happen for a normal process is when failures occur, the process can leave the files that it has opened in a inconsistent state. For example, if you understand the operating system and open, if your process opens files and the operating system crashes due to power failure or other reasons, what really happens is the files that are opened could be left in an inconsistent fashion. Similarly, if a file is being operated simultaneously by more than one user, again the chance of corruption exists on the file, because there is no guarantees on how the file is being accessed simultaneously by multiple users. And this has to be prevented in a database, because the data that is being stored in a database needs to be in a consistent fashion always that is to be maintained. For example, if you consider a banking database, uh, whatever happens you, you wish that you should not lose your money that you are depositing into the bank. If the bank comes and tells there is a power failure and we have lost your 1 million rupees that you have deposited, you are going to 
you know, uh, say that this is quite unacceptable and you want the bank to ensure that whatever happens, uh, the data that is stored in the banking database is consistent all the time. This is an essential difference between database and file systems. File systems could be, there may not be any guarantees associated with file systems in operating uh, systems. Whereas, when you take the database transactions, there is certain level of guarantee that is given to you regarding the state of the database at the end of the execution of the transactions. Now, let us look at what kind of failures can happen in a system and what are the consequence of those failures. There could be different kinds of failures. We have actually listed a few failures here and we will start discussing them in more detail as we go along. Now, you can see here the first kind of failure that can happen is a hardware or a software error in the computer uh, during transaction executing. This means, it is possible that there is a problem in the hardware or the software. For example, it could be an operating system bug or it could be a hardware bug that could have made the computer fail, which means that when you are executing the set of instructions that is shown earlier as a transaction, the failure can occur. Okay. The other kind of failure that can occur is internal to the transaction. Failure caused by an operation in the transaction. For example, you are actually dividing by a 0. Divide by 0 will cause, cause the uh, program to crash. right? So, this is another kind of error that can happen in the system. The other kind of errors is conditions that cause the cancellation of a transaction. For example, data needed for the transaction not found. You are trying to transfer funds from one account to another account. Then you recognize that the other account does not exist. This will result in the transaction to be aborted because the fund transfer is not happening correctly. The account into which you should be transferring the funds is not found in this particular case. The other important issue is concurrency control enforcement, which is to be done when multiple transactions are simultaneously operating on the database. For example, if you really uh, see how people can operate with the accounts, it is possible that to you could be withdrawing some amount of money using your ATM, uh, ATM machine, but at the same time there could be another transaction trying to transfer funds from your account to another account. When uh, this happens, it is possible that the state of the database could be corrupted unless there is some kind of a, a concurrency control that is enforced to ensure that the system is in a consistent state. We are going to look at during the uh, subsequent lectures in detail how the concurrency control is enforced by the database management system on transactions, so that the database is in a consistent fashion. Now, it is also possible because of the concurrency control that is enforced, a transaction is aborted, because the transaction has started executing and the concurrency control mechanism found that the transaction cannot proceed anymore, then it may also abort the transaction. So, this is another reason why a transaction could fail. There could be other reasons as well something like loss of data in the disk blocks during a transaction uh, due to let, it, let us say the disk head has crashed. So, then it is possible that you are not able to retrieve the data correctly from the disk. This is uh, disk failure. This occurs when the disk hard disk has failed. There could be other catastrophic reasons for you when you deal with the databases things like power failure, fire, 
and other kinds of catastrophes like earthquake which could destroy the data and they are beyond the human control. Now, one of the things you should realize is all these kinds of failures are possible and in the event of these failures the database still should ensure that the data that is stored in the database is consistent and it is available by other means. That is you are able to retrieve the data back even when failures of this nature occur. Now, a part of this lecture will explore how you can handle this situation when failures occur when transactions are executing. Now, what we are going to look at it is we will uh, intuitively understand the concept of transaction to start with and we will say what can happen to a transaction in the event of failures. We in fact looked at several kinds of failures starting from a transactional error to a disk failure to a power failure to a more catastrophic failure. So, what we would like to see is what happens if these failures occur when transactions are in progress. Imagine you are withdrawing money from your bank account and the power fails. Now, what happens? Is your bank account still shows correct balance or is it going to show that you have already withdrawn when you have not taken your amount? What is the state in which your bank database will be left when the failure occurs when you are withdrawing money from the account. Now, here is a case where it is shown more precisely to say what kind of scenarios can prevail and how those scenarios have to be addressed. Look at this scenario 1, what happens if the credit transaction fails after executing IC 1 and before executing IC 2. Remember, I C 1 is a read account balance instruction and I C 2 is when it is actually modifying that balance locally, it still has not written that value back onto the database, because a write has to be done at the end of it, I C 3 has to be done to write the balance back onto the back end database. Now, what happens if the credit transaction fails? after executing I C 1, but before executing I C 2. Now, in a normal scenario, if you do not really take care of this situation, it is possible that the database is left in an unknown and undeterministic condition when the failure occurs, but you have to actually prevent this from happening by saying that you will bring back the database to a consistent fashion if a failure occurs. In this particular case, you have to ensure that all the um, instructions I C 1, I C 2 and I C 3 are either executed or not executed at all. This is a very important property that needs to be ensured for database transactions. We are going to see this property in more detail, this property is called the atomicity property of the transactions. That is all the instructions put together have to be executed either in full or none of them should be executed at all. In fact, if you carefully look at the initial example where we had preceded the three instructions I C 1, I C 2 and I C 3 with a begin transaction and an end transaction, all the instructions between the begin and end have to obey this property called the atomicity property. That either all the instructions are executed in full or none of them are executed. This is what we see as scenario 1, what can happen if the credit transaction fails after executing IC 1 be and before executing IC 2. Let us move to scenario 2, what happens in scenario 2? If the credit and debit transaction execute simultaneously, what are the likely things that can happen? I in fact shown a case where 
I C 1 is executed, then followed by I D 1 is executed, then I C 2 is executed, then I D 2 is executed, then I C 3 and followed by I D 3. If you carefully look at the way it was written here, both the credit and the debit, inter, inter, uh, debit uh, instructions have been interleaved. I C 1 is basically a read account number and the balance, I D 1 is also a read instruction on the database except that this is a debit instruction, the earlier is a credit instruction. Now, this will also read the balance in the account number. Now, if you say that both are operating on the same account number, they are reading the balance at the same time. Now, imagine I C 1 has the same balance, the, the, the value that is currently let us say the account has a balance of 500 rupees in your account, then both I C 1 and I D 1 read the value as 500. Now, imagine that you are depositing 200 rupees and uh, withdrawing 100 rupees. Now, if I C 2 will say that 500 plus 200 which is actually 700 and I C 3 will try writing 700 back into the database whereas I D 2 will try to reduce the balance from 500 by 400 and I D 3 will write the value as 400. Now, we can see you have lost some amount in the process because the credit amount is completely lost because both the credit and the debit transactions are simultaneously operating and only the debit is shown here the credit is lost. The credit that is done into the database is last in this particular case. So, this is what we see as scenario 2, when in transactions operate concurrently on the database items, it is possible that the database state is left in an inconsistent fashion as shown in this particular example. Now, we have to prevent this from happening and this is what we call as a consistency property of the transaction. Now, what we mean by consistency here is, when the transactions are operating concurrently, simultaneously, you need to enforce the condition that the transactions in effect have executed one after the other, rather than simultaneously. This is uh, in some sense, you need to prevent if there is conflict between transactions they operating simultaneously on the database items has to be prevented and this is achieved by what we earlier called as concurrency control mechanisms. So, we need concurrency control mechanisms for making sure that the database when it is operated upon simultaneously by multiple transactions is not left in an inconsistent state. this is what we see as a scenario 2 and scenario 2 gives the property of consistency whereas, scenario 1 gives the property of atomicity to the transaction. Now, let us move on to the third scenario, scenario 3 where basically it is possible for one transaction to see the values of the other transaction before it is actually finished its full operations. Now, that is what is actually stated here. What happens if the result of the credit transaction are visible to debit transaction before it is actually written onto the database? What does this mean? This is elaborated further by saying that I C 2 writes the balance. In the earlier case, if you are actually depositing 200 rupees, when your initial balance is 500, I C 2 will write a value of 700. Now, the debit can read this value of 700 even before the credit has actually committed its values to the back end database. Now, you can the debit can now go and then withdraw the money from the new balance even before it is written back onto the back end database. If this happens, 
the results of one transaction are visible in this particular case the credit transaction are visible to the debit transaction before it is actually finished execution. Now, this results in uh, what we call as an isolation property, because for some reason if the credit transaction fails later okay, for various other reasons if the credit transaction fails and if its results are already visible for the debit transaction, we need to abort the debit transaction also, because it has read the values of a transaction that is aborted. This is what we mean by causing cascading aborts. If a transaction values or results are available for some other transaction before it is committed, it could lead to cascading aborts. To avoid this, what we have to do is we have to enforce the property called isolation. Isolation ensures that the transaction results, the values that a transaction or the values which a transaction has changed, the values of the data items which a transaction has changed are not available for other transactions till the transaction is actually committed. Actually, concurrency control protocols and commit protocols which go together ensure the consistency of the database in the presence of multiple transactions executing simultaneously on the database. Now, let us move on to the uh, fourth scenario which leads to the final property, fourth property of the transaction. Now, this scenario 4 tells what happens if the database server crashes before the changed data is written onto a stable storage. One could imagine several situations where the database values have been written, the transactions have committed, but their final values have not been written onto the database for various reasons. Now, whatever happens after the transaction says it has committed, its value should be preserved. The value that the transaction has changed should never be altered after the transaction has committed. So, you have no way of saying that the results of the transaction is last after it has committed. This is what we mean by the property of durability. All results of the committed transactions are preserved after that point once the transaction has committed. So, you have to guarantee this in spite of any other kind of failure that may happen to your database. These four properties are very important properties when we talk about transactions. Now, just to repeat these properties, atomicity ensures which we have actually derived from scenario 1 ensures that all the instructions of a transaction are executed in full or none. So, the first question of some part of the instruction being executed and some part of the transaction instruction not being executed does not arise at all, because you ensure that all the instructions of the transaction are executed in full or none. The second property which we discussed is a consistency property. When multiple transactions are accessing data simultaneously, the access is protected through concurrency control mechanisms to ensure that the updates which are done by the concurrently executing transactions are not last on the database. This is what we actually mean by the property of consistency. And we also mentioned that consistency is ensured in database management systems by using a set of concurrency control protocols. And we are going to study these concurrency control protocols in depth during these lectures. Now, the third property is isolation, 
the isolation property ensures that the results of one transaction will not be visible to the other transaction till the transaction commits. This ensures that there are no problems relating to partial results being available for other transactions. We also mentioned that when this happens cascading aborts takes place when one transaction results have been read by other transaction and the earlier transaction has to be aborted. And to prevent this cascading aborts we enforce the property of isolation on the transactions. Okay. The fourth property is the durability property and it says that the effects of the committed transactions are not last after commitment. For example, you have deposited some amount into your bank and you want to ensure that it is never last after you have actually deposited the money into the bank, it will never be last. That is basically the durability property. Now, all these four properties put together are nicely known as the acid properties of the transaction as shown here. It is a summarization of the four properties that we have been so far discussing. A stands for atomicity, C stands for consistency, I stands for isolation and D stands for durability. So, these four properties put together are called as the acid properties of the transactions. A normal process will not obey these acid properties, whereas the transactions in the database context will obey these acid properties. Now, one of the things that we are going to look at through these lectures is see how these acid properties are realized by the database management system when we are actually executing transactions in the database. Now, we will also further elaborate these acid properties little more formally by actually taking what happens and how these acid properties are ensured. Now, as you can see here in the case of the debit transaction all the instructions starting from the begin transaction to the end transaction will be executed in full or none which actually means that I D 1, I D 2, I D 3 have to be executed in full. Now, one of the things that we are going to do is when there is a begin transaction we record the state of the database. Now, whatever happens after the transaction starts executing if there is a failure you ensure that you get back to that state by restoring the state to the original state if the instructions are not executed in full. For example, if your original balance starting balance is 500 rupees and for some reason the debit transaction cannot be executed all the instructions restore the balance back to 500. This is what we mean by undoing a transaction. The transaction all the instructions which were executed partially till completion of the transaction are rolled back which means all those instructions will be nullified. You actually roll back on those transactions, so that the effect of those instructions is nullified. So, this is what we mean by atomicity property. We ensure that either all the instructions are either executed together or none of them are executed. Okay. Now, again uh, to, uh, to stress again what really we were talking about consistency in case of both debit transaction and credit transaction access the balance data simultaneously, we will protect them through the concurrency control mechanisms. A simple mechanism that we are going to use is we lock the database items and allow only transactions which acquired these locks to change the values of those data items and only when the transaction releases the locks on those data items other transactions will be allowed to use those data items. This is a very simple technique. There are more sophisticated techniques that can be used for enforcing con concurrency control mechanisms, but this is what we, are, we would like to do to ensure that the consistency property is enforced or realized on the 
database. Now, when you go to the isolation property, you are going to look at uh, either debit or credit transaction results will not be available unless they are committed. In one way, these transactions have to hold on to these locks when they are acquired and should not release those locks for other transactions till they have committed to ensure the values that they have modified are not available to other transactions till they have finished execution, till they reach the state of end transaction, which means that now they have committed their values and after that only those results will be visible for other transactions. Now, there are several ways in which we can ensure the durability property. The durability property will ensure that you know you have backups, sufficient backups, you have written all your logs, committed transaction logs and there are various ways in which the effects of this are preserved to make sure that all the committed transaction values can always be obtained by using the backups and the transaction logs. We are going to look at this property and how this is realized in detail as we go along. Now, we come into more details of what really happens with transactions. For this, actually we will introduce certain terminology to start with. The idea is to get more formal with the transaction concepts, see them in more detail as we progress. So far, we have been looking at the properties very intuitively, trying to understand them in a very intuitive fashion. Now, we will try to understand the concepts in a more formal way. Now, there are two states in which the transactions can enter into. One is a commit state, which actually means when the transaction has completely executed all its instructions, it can enter into a commit state, which actually means that all the reads and writes of the data items it has actually read can now be written back and they have been safely written back onto the database, in which case we say that the transaction has committed itself. Now, for some reason the transaction has started executing, but it cannot commit the values of the data items that it has changed, which it has read from the database, then we say that the database has entered the state of abort, which actually means that all the effects of the transaction will be nullified and database state will be left when the transaction start executed. That is equivalent to saying that I actually had a begin transaction, the state of the database when I started executing this transaction, which is the begin transaction and I actually keep the state back to that initial state when the transaction started executing that is called the abort state. So, we have commit and abort, a transaction could be either committing or aborting. When it says it has committed, it is writing all the values that it has read the and changed back onto the database. When it says it is aborting, it is not committing any of the values that it has changed. Yeah. So, to emphasize the transactions are not just ordinary programs, ordinary program instructions all our discussion today highlights the fact that additional requirements are placed on transactions to ensure that these acid properties assume atomicity, consistency and isolation are realized with the transactions. Now, here is a case where we can quickly see with respect to commit and abort what really happens for the atomicity property. Now, atomicity property says that a real world event either happens or does not happen. Now, if you take the case where a person either books or does not book his tickets, which actually means that when he is actually booked his tickets, the transaction has committed the values. When he says he did not book the ticket, it means that the transaction has aborted. And again, to give the state the uh, thing that it is not true of ordinary programs. A hardware or a software failure could leave files partially updated, which is not the case in the case of transactions. When you say I have booked my ticket, it means that you have booked your ticket 
that means the transaction booking tickets has committed and when it says it has not booked the ticket it means that it has not committed it is aborted. Now, coming to the consistency property you have to ensure that the set of integrity constraints that are specified by the transaction are all enforced when the transaction has executed. Now, what we mean by this is transaction designer must ensure that assuming the database was in a state that is satisfied all integrity constraints when execution of a transaction got started, then when the transaction is actually completed execution you need to ensure that all the integrity constraints are once again satisfied. In a simple way consistency can be ensured by saying that the transaction execution results in a serializable execution that is the transactions executed as if all the operations have been executed in a serial fashion. We are going to look at that particular uh, property right now in the next few minutes in a little more detail and see what does it mean by consistency preservation. And isolation essentially will avoid cascaded webots as explained earlier. Here is a simple case where isolation was uh, given in a more detailed uh, fashion. It it's, uh, relates to when multiple transactions execute uh, concurrently and you want to actually ensure that uh, the final execution does preserve the consistency by ensuring that one transaction values are not read by the other, other transaction till it has finished. Now, we will see this property of uh, concurrency and isolation together by taking a simple example as given in this particular case. As explained in this diagram as you can see this here T 1 has two operations O P 1 and O P 1 2 and T 2 has two operations operation 2 1 and 2 2. Now, it is possible that the sequence of operations can be interleaved in multiple ways on your database. As you can see here one possible sequence is operation 1 1 executed first of transaction 1, then operation 2 1 of transaction 2, then operation 2 2 is um, executed of transaction 2 and operation 1 2 of the first transaction is executed. As you can see here from the execution sequence of this we may not be able to say that transaction T 1 completed all its operations before transaction 2 is executed. But on the other hand if there is a way you can ensure that all the instructions of transaction 1 are finished before transaction 2 it is equivalent to saying that the set of instructions that are executed are all in a serial fashion. Now, one of the requirements of operation 1 1 and operation 1 2 to be serializable in this context is they are not operating on the same account. It is possible that two people are withdrawing money from two different accounts. Since there is no conflict in this particular case between the two operations it does it does not really matter even if O 1 2 is executed later we can always say interchange the operations since there is no conflict in this particular case and rewrite the set of operations as if they have been executed as O 1 2, O 1 1, O 1 2 and then O 2 1 and O 2 2. When uh, operations do not conflict it is possible for us to interchange operations and then ensure what we see the property of serializability. That is all the operations of T 1 have finished before T 2 okay, that is what we mean by serializability or in other sense what we are going to say is all the operations of T 1 since they have finished T 1 precedes T 2 in terms of how the operations have been executed on the database this is called serializability. However, let us say that the operation 1 1 and operation 
two one conflict with each other in the sense that they access the same database item. In this particular case, we can say that they are accessing the same account and the same balance and they are trying to modify the same balance. They are not just reading, but writing values modified values onto the database. In which case, we say there is a conflict. Now, operations will conflict if they operate on the same data item and one of them is right. That is what we mean by conflicting operations. When transactions conflict, we need to serialize the transactions and this is what we mean by conflict serializability. The conflicting operations should be executed in such a way that we know that the conflicting operations are executed in a serial fashion, which actually means that we can ensure that the uh, operations on the database in this particular case, if O11 and O21 have uh, conflicting, they have been executed one after the other and that decides how the transactions proceed with each other. Now, let us see the uh, following scenario where on O11 and O21, which are two conflicting operations, we say that T1 preceded T2 and let us say O12 and O22 are also conflicting. Now, let us say as far as those operations are concerned uh, T 2 precedes T 1. Now, this is a uh, this is a scenario that will result in the transactions T 1 and C T 2 uh, not being serializable, because as far as the conflicting operations O 1 1 and O 2 1 are concerned the T 1 is preceding T 2 and in the case of O 1 2 and O 2 2 which are again conflicting the transactions are proceeding in the other direction T 2 is preceding T 1. So, we cannot say as far as the conflicting operations are concerned T 1 is executed before T 2 in one case T 1 executed before T 2 in the other case T 2 has executed before T 1. This is a very interesting thing which we are going to study in detail in the uh, next lecture. We see how transactions need to preserve uh, the property of conflict serializability. Only when transactions execute and they are serializable, conflict serializable, we say that the database is uh, uh, yeah, the transactions have executed in the correct fashion on the database. We are going to further study this property in tomorrow's lecture in detail as concurrency control mechanisms. The concurrency control mechanisms are expected to provide the property of conflict serializability. They ensure that when transactions are executing concurrently, we can serialize them in a um, we, the transactions are serializable and that is a property that is ensured by concurrency control mechanisms. We go to study the concurrency control mechanisms in detail in tomorrow's lecture. Okay.